If you're a regular listener of the podcast, you might have seen this episode's description and thought, we're going to talk about fundraising and crowdfunding again. But uh, since meeting this filmmaker and uh, startup founder, Emily Best, in November, I've really wanted to get her onto the podcast to talk about her company, Seed and Spark, and her brand of audience building. Seed and Spark is a crowdfunding platform, but it reimagines it from the perspective of an indie filmmaker, which she is, and takes that experience way past the fundraising portion into audience building and even into distribution. A lot of really exciting announcements coming out of her company lately. Uh, Emily joins me today via Skype to talk about how the company got started and her vision for making it a touchstone of you know, an integral part of the indie filmmaker experience. Um, and we'll even talk a little bit about film festivals and how to make uh, your crowdfunding platform, whether it's Seed and Spark or, or something else, um, you know, a part of your festival run. I'm Chris Holland, and you're listening to Film Festival Secrets. Emily, thanks so much for joining me on the Film Festival Secrets podcast. My absolute pleasure. Uh, it's really nice to see you again, although the audience can't see you. I can see you through the magic of Skype. Uh, we met at Indie Memphis. Yes, which is, you know, high on the list of my favorite festivals now that I've been there. I, it's one of my favorites. I go back at every chance that I, that I can. And now that I live in Atlanta, I, I can go more often. Yeah, and what a cool city and what great ribs. Yes, there was much smoked meat consumed. Oh, my night. God. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah, I just got back from Oxford. <laughs> Still after, hurts. Oxford, oh, Mississippi. Yeah. Oxford. Oh, <sighs> food. Yeah. yeah there's, oh. um, the, I don't know how well you know them, but there's four women there who run that festival, three of whom have been doing it for 12 years. And this was their last year. They said, you know, we've volunteered for long enough. If the community wants to take it over and, and make it happen, great, but we're done. So it was, it was a special year and, you know, festivals, especially little, little regional festivals like that are so, you know, so emotionally affecting sometimes. Absolutely. I mean, you know, to me, the, the regional festivals are sort of the crux of, I don't know, the kind of old, old fashioned version of storytelling where everybody gathered around the fire and the storytellers sort of spun their tales and it was celebratory and there was food and there was drink and there was merriment and it was an event, you know? And so to me, in a lot of ways, especially those regional festivals carry that really, I don't know, sort of ancient or sacred feeling of gathering around storytelling to me. I've never heard it expressed that way before, but now I'm totally going to steal that. That was Oh, great. all yeah. yours. You can have it. <laughs> Uh, so I think Seed and Spark kind of fits well into that that world of shared storytelling and um, communal art. Uh, you know, crowdfunding is no longer a new thing, and although certainly to, to many people it is, um, but I think in the artistic community, it's kind of an expected part of making an independent film these days um, yeah. when, when somebody says to you, Oh, I'm thinking about making a movie. If you're talking to somebody who knows that world at all, they're going to say, Oh, you, are you going to do a, a crowdfunding campaign for that? Um, but I think seed and spark is, is very different. Um, you know, the first exposure I had to it for real, I mean, I sort of knew about it peripherally, but um, my first real exposure to it was for the film, little cabbage. Mm hmm. Um, which was done by a couple of filmmakers here in Atlanta, um, Jen West and James Martin. And I was really struck by how geared towards a filmmaker's needs it was. Sure. Um, and, and I'll touch on one feature and then sort of let you talk a little bit. But the thing that I, I liked best about it was the ability for a filmmaker to break down what their costs were what their budget was and to identify down to things as granular, not just like, here's what we need to pay the actors and right. here's what we, but you know, here's what we <clears> need <throat> for craft services on Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> here's, here's how many tanks of gas we need to get 
the film to get the crew from the airport to their hotel and and get the stuff. And it's like here you you can sponsor a tank of gas, which is what I did. I was like, what's the least sexy thing I can sponsor? That's right? like, awesome. Yeah. Like what if, people are going to sponsor actors or what, like what can yeah. I sponsor that like nobody else is going to, and the filmmakers will be like, oh thank God. <laughs> right. So a tank of gas is what I sponsored, and I That's thought awesome. this this is really really different. Um, so tell me a little bit about how the crowdfunding platform came to be yeah. and then what's building up around it. Sure. Um, so in 2010, um, sorry, 2011, uh, I got tricked into producing my first feature film. Um, and, uh, I, I really didn't know anything about the landscape of independent filmmaking. Um, I was sort of wonderfully naive and therefore charging ahead as if of course the world wants this story if only they knew it existed um and you know a filmmaker's first exposure to does the world want this film tends to be in their investment conversations but investment conversations happen around a set of factors that actually have very little to do with how badly the world wants a story um, and much more to do with sort of the historical data around how stories like this have performed. And that's a bummer because the historical data is fraught with uh, institutional and social bias, right? So if you happen to be making an independent drama starring all women um, that has no sex and no romantic plot line in it, uh, investors look at that and go, yeah, no thanks. Absolutely not. I'm not interested. Uh and so I was like, but if if only you understood how important it was that this group of women be able to bring this story to the screen for this following set of reasons. And they'd say, yeah, I just don't think it's going to make any money. And when we were doing this, uh, they were right. And maybe maybe they're still right. We'll see. Um, but uh, but we really wanted to to get a sense of if our community, our early audience was interested in getting involved with us, but we realized we needed to get more granular than, you know, we need $25,000. And actually, uh, we raised money from sort of friends, family, and fools, and we had a $20,000 sort of budget gap. Um, and we were shooting this film in Maine in the summer, and we needed to get up there. Uh, and we had only this one window where everybody's schedules lined up. You know how indie films go. Mm -hmm. Um, and we were $20,000 short. And that was like not something we could do with a pound of flesh. We we needed this money for this film. And so um, while Kickstarter and Indiegogo were kind of rising in the ranks, um, our filmmaker friends were very familiar with it, but they were really broke. Um, our friends' parents were not. Um, and I'm not talking about with the platforms. I'm talking about with the concept of crowdfunding. And we wanted to give them something beyond, hey, here's a bunch of, you know, 20 to 30 something women who are going to go up to Maine for the summer and make a movie. And wouldn't you like to fund that? But really materially, how is it, what will it take for us to make this? And where might you see your contribution fit the best? So we made a wedding registry for the film because that's something that everyone is familiar with in some way or another. Um, pretty much everyone's used one at some time or another. And it's really enjoyable for people to sort of imagine, oh, you know, every time they make pasta with the colander that I buy them, they'll think of me, right? Or whatever sort of narcissistic stories we spin in our heads. Um, <laughs> but it's uh, it's really effective, the wedding registry. Um and and really fun for people to shop them and kind of contribute to where they think they are most interested. Um, I always buy sort of like the kitchen utensils, right? And um, and so we we posted a list of everything we needed from you know the camera rental and the car rentals to the bug spray and the sunscreen and uh, the you know the wardrobe and the stuff we needed behind the the gaff tape. And the stuff we needed on camera, like the curtains and the duvetine and things like that. And so 
it was telling the story of what it would take to make this film through the list of things that we needed to make it. Um, and we sent it out to everyone we knew and we raised 23,000 in cash and hundreds of thousands of dollars in loans and gifts of wow. goods and services. And more importantly, locations, locations that we had not asked for locations that once people started to wrap their mind around what we were doing, they started to offer to us and we ended up rewriting the script to incorporate them. So our audience very quickly became our collaborative partners in this film. And I think the film, well, you know, it definitely, certainly like a flawed first film. It was a first feature for all of us, um, except the cinematographer and the lead actor. Uh, and the, those are, by the way, good people to not have in their first feature uh -huh. if, if, you, if everyone else is in their first feature. Um, I think you can really powerfully feel the sense of community that was that that made this movie. Um, and what was really important is how important a sort of conceptual role community played in the film writ large. Um, so it was a very interesting experience. And that was uh, the first that we know of wish list um, made like a wedding registry that was used uh, sort of as a crowdfunding tool. And that would become the basis for seed and spark. So on seed and spark, you can list the individual items you need and your audience can contribute directly to those items or they can loan them to you if they have them. You know, um, we had a coffee shop loan us 60 pounds of coffee, arguably the most important thing on a film set. Um, <laughs> But behind the gaff tape, the coffee, um, what you can't fix with gaff tape, you should be able to fix with coffee. Uh, um, so, so these are the sorts of things that, um, started to kind of reveal themselves like, oh, right. Well, independent filmmaking is always about what you can get for free. So in that case, why wouldn't the crowdfunding platform acknowledge that this isn't about fundraising? This is about filmmaking. And what is filmmaking about? Well, it's storytelling. To whom? To an audience. So if all you're getting out of crowdfunding as a filmmaker is money to make your movie, that's entirely missing the point. The whole point is getting the audience who will watch the movie and advocate for the movie when it's finished. And so Seed and Spark over the last two years has been building an independent ecosystem where a filmmaker can control their creative from beginning all the way through distribution, um, build a really powerful relationship with their audience throughout the entire life cycle of the film, not just for the 30 or 45 days that you're crowdfunding, and then actually deliver the film to audiences on the platforms where those audiences prefer watching their content not just sending them a link, which frankly, a lot of people still don't know what to do with that. You know, mm. there are a lot of people who don't know how to get a link that you send them to stream to their television, but they might have an Apple TV. So you should be on iTunes, right? right. Or they might have Verizon Fios cable. So you should be available to them on VOD or they might prefer Hulu plus. So you should be available there or they might, you know what I mean? Like these, these are things that Filmmakers don't need to be worrying about as much. Like, how do I change the viewing behavior of the American public? Like, mm. don't worry about that. Let's just get your film everywhere they're already watching stuff. And they're already watching stuff in quantity and paying for it. So, so how does Seed yeah. and Spark do that? So uh, we like to, we prefer to start with projects uh, at the crowdfunding stage um, where we can really help them, um, including in the sort of pre-production phase of their crowdfunding build and initiate a relationship with their audience that they grow and sustain over their entire careers. Um, crowdfund on Seed and Spark um, and films that crowdfund on Seed and Spark and reach a threshold of 500 followers. So these don't have, even have to be people who've contributed monetarily, but people who've given a digital high five to your campaign, essentially signing up for your mailing list, will qualify you now for uh, distribution deals with emerging pictures for theatrical with Verizon Fios for cable VOD, and then through a, a relationship, a preferred partner relationship with Quiver Digital, uh, that will get you to, see, I told you I would mess it up, um, <laughs> iTunes, Hulu, Vudu, uh, Amazon, Google, Netflix. There's and that's a, just a the beginning. There. 
there is a mnemonic that we need to come up with um, that's going to keep changing and getting longer, right? Because sure. you're going to have to add, you know, Indie Flicks and Vessel and, uh, you know, and all those other ones. Mm. Um, we're, we're also going to be, uh, I've been back and forth and I'm, I'm saying this on this podcast to hold my feet to the fire. We're going to put together a branded channel on Indie Flicks. Um, and we're constantly seeking out these partnerships to deliver independent films uh, wherever a certain filmmaker's audiences are. And it doesn't necessarily make sense to distribute on all of the platforms all the time because if you have a really robust relationship with your audience, they're going to be telling you where they want you to deliver it because you're going to be asking them, right? right? <laughs> In which case, you don't need to pay for the deliverables to go to 12 platforms if your audience, by and large, is only on two of them. So you can build smart economic models that you can monetize and that you control. Um, and so we're not a distributor. Like we keep getting sort of thrown into, oh, Seasons Park's a distributor now. And we're like, no, we don't take rights and we don't um we don't take exclusivity. What we're really interested in is facilitating uh the pipeline so that filmmakers actually have access to building really smart business models. Wow. There's a whole lot there to unpack. Yeah. Uh, so tell me about it. Yeah. This is all like a lot of this has happened over the last four weeks for us. Yeah. So um, we still have a lot to unpack. Yeah. I, you know, I'm going to bring you back and we're going to unpack a lot of that on the distribution side cool. for the moment though. I'd really like to sort of bring it back to film festivals. Okay. Um, and I know that um, you've got, at the film festival where I work, the Atlanta Film Festival, um, there are three films uh, that have gone through the Seed and Spark process yeah. that will be playing. And that's really exciting. Uh, Charlotte. Keep your ears. Charlotte, right? Yeah, Charlotte. Uh, which is and a short. Little Cabbage, which is also a short. And um, Movement been in and Location. location. Mm -hmm. So what would, if the folks from those films were here, and, and you know them all better than I do, um, if they were, if they, let they, let's say they are listening, um, how do they leverage what they've built on Seed and Spark to get people to come out to the festival? Sure. So first of all, you have the, the mailing list that's been generated out of your crowdfunding campaign, which is, which is nothing to, you know, it's between 200 and 500 people, let's say. And, you know, we're all so highly networked and connected now that um, you can certainly leverage that mailing list to let people know, to ask them to share, to send, uh, to send them pre-composed tweets and Facebook messages to share with their community. Um, obviously, to say anybody you know in Atlanta, please share this directly with them, um, which I have been doing with my. Uh, it turns out the only people I know in Atlanta are. are other filmmakers. So they're going to hear about this anyway. Uh, I looked at my, I looked at my, um, you know, my Facebook for everybody who's in Atlanta. And I was like, I, I only know filmmakers in Atlanta. Um, but it's really, uh, that's sort of step one. The, the second thing is to take what you learn from audience building and leverage it at festivals. Now, I just want to say this. I don't want to present myself as an expert about festival anything in front of you. So if at any point I say something where you're like, that is not right, uh, please go ahead and call me out. Um, well, you're so, one of the best audience builders I know, so I, I, oh, well, I doubt that's going to happen. But I'm interested to see, like, what are the lessons that you teach on Seed and Spark? And if there are any tools that, like, I don't know if there's anything that has to do with geography or, you know, but how can you connect what you've done with Seed and Spark? And, and the list is, like, that's a big one, right? Sure, yeah. Uh, the email thing is, is that's really right. big. So, um, so we take a class called crowdfunding to build independence all over the country. That's actually how we met. Right. Yep. Um, and, uh, that's not dissimilar to being on a festival tour for your film. And we're trying to build a lasting, sustainable, direct relationship with our audience. Right. In this case, we're a multi-sided marketplace, but for our crowdfunding side, our audience is filmmakers, right? Cause that's who we want to get to the site. Mm -hmm. Um, and we do a number of things. One, we show up with something to offer, which is this free class um, and a lot of materials. Um, so we give people something to interact with. The second thing we do is we have a plan for people to sign up with us uh, there. We, so we have, and this is a plug-in for your MailChimp, um, if you use MailChimp to manage your mailing, um, we use text to join. 
So you can send a text message, um, 44144, I think, and you can send a spark to 41444, whatever it is, 44144. We'll put it in the show notes. And we'll figure out what it is. Um, And you get a little pop-up that says, you know, thank you so much. Send us your email address and we'll send you um, all of the information you've learned here and more. And then people sign up and then we follow up with an email that not only includes you know, follow up information to what we offered, but special offers from our sponsors um, and uh, and other cool things like a discount to Bright Ideas magazine subscription and and just kind of a general thank you for participating and joining our mailing list. So number one, we have something for people to interact with. Number two, we have a way to capture their contact information long term. Um, And email addresses are much more valuable than Twitter followers or Facebook uh, likes. Um, And number three, we have a plan to follow up with something that's valuable um, so that the first interaction with receiving something from us is one that makes you be like, hey, I will open these emails in the future. Um, And that's, I mean, that's to me the crux of a festival strategy. Yeah, I I definitely agree with that. Can you talk for just a second about why email addresses are are more valuable than Twitter followers? Oh, sure. So imagine some concentric circles. And in the outermost concentric circle is all of the people you don't know. And that is obviously the largest circle of the circles because that's most of the people. And then inside that concentric circle is all of the people you can reach through your current social media reach. And that's something that you're constantly, that's a circle that you're constantly expanding, right? The more you participate on social media. And that's good, but those, um, that reach is feed-based or algorithm-based, which is to say it's not that reliable. When you tweet something, not everybody necessarily sees it unless they're looking at the right time. When you Facebook something, Lord, when, Lord knows who sees it or why. 6%. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Every year they're like, it was 16%. Now it's two. You're like, cool. It's really losing utility. Um, so, so gathering followers is great, but really that's only a step in between the ether and the center. And as you close in on the center, the next level of engagement from social media is email. Everybody pretty much 90% of mobile phone, uh, subscribers in the U S have smartphones, uh, which means they're getting email right into their pockets. And that is, we all know, a much more reliable way to get a hold of us. Um, And even now I'm seeing filmmakers leveraging um, texting platforms, um, Mm. which is cool too, because that can be a really reliable way to reach people. Nobody can resist reading a text message. Um, And also you have to be brief. Um, But what's what's interesting about that is the highest conversions, right? That is... um, from emails sent, the highest percentage conversion rate is uh, from emails. So if you tweet something, um, the average call to action gets about a 2% conversion rate. If you Facebook something, it gets about an 8% conversion rate. When you email, we're talking in the 20 to 40% conversion rate, depending on the relationship you've built over time with your audience. So an email is infinitely more well not infinitely it's a, a mul- very primarily, but multi 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 yeah. multiplicatively more valuable than <laughs> a facebook post or a twitter post um and uh and so that's really where um the the email addresses are are so important particularly for longevity's sake right um so if you want to get people into what i call the center of this concentric circle those are the people who actually do the stuff They fund your project, they show up to your movie, they download your movie, they share your movie, um, they do the thing, they do the call to action. Um, Social media to me is just an interface between the ether of the people you don't know and the center, the people who actually show up and behave as your audience. Gotcha. So uh, just to get to nitty gritty for for a little second, um, what email functionality is it that, um, that Seed and Spark offers? How does that work? So, um, from your crowdfunding page, you, uh, can post updates and that goes directly into the inboxes of the people that you're, um, that have followed you. Um, and then once you're done with your campaign or at any point in your campaign, you can also download that list, um, and, you know, add it to your running MailChimp or whatever. Gotcha. 
cool. Mailchimp being uh, the one of the more popular ones you're seeing. You've mentioned it twice now. Uh, yeah, Mailchimp, Constant Contact, Nation Builder. I mean, even I mean, really, Mailchimp and Constant Contact are probably the most widely used uh, email management systems. Yeah. I've been using Mailchimp for a while now, and, and not just because they're based in Atlanta, but um, I always kind of wonder when who, who's going to come knock Mailchimp off the off the hill. You know, it always seems like there's you know because Constant Contact for the longest time like they were yeah. It. Yeah. And, um, so no, I, I, I Mailchimp knocked them off with like cuter branding. Really, um, they were also a heck of a lot easier to use. I was using yeah, them both absolutely. at absolutely. the same time, and I was just like, Mailchimp was a revelation. Yeah. And now, not quite so much, but I think that's a that's a big part of it is is ease of use for sure. Absolutely. Well, you and I are going to talk on this very podcast again very soon. I really look forward to it. And I, I wish um, we had more time, but I have a festival to go help uh, put on. Yeah, you sure do. <laughs> and it sounds like you've got some some pretty busy stuff going on. That the announcement about about um, that Quiver digital arrangement that's mm -hmm. awesome. A um, uh, couple of things. Number one, um, where do people find you and Seed and Spark online? Uh, seedandspark.com, S-E-E-D-A-N-D-S-P-A-R-K, um, at Seed and Spark on all of the social medias. Um, and you can find me at Emily Best on Twitter. That's where I am an embarrassing amount of time. <laughs> and the, the class that you mentioned, I think the, some of the course materials are online somewhere. Yeah, all of that is available on our website on the How It Works page under Awesome Downloads. And um, you can go to our events page and see where there's a class near you soon. We'll be in Utah. We'll be in Texas. We'll be in uh, Chattanooga and Durham and Sarasota. We're going to be all over the place. Good for so, you. Yeah, you should be able to find us soon. Yeah, there's only like 50 classes left this year. Excellent. Well, not excellent, but, you know, because if you could do 300, I'd, I'd be happy with that. It's <laughs> such a valuable class, and, and I really, so really much. enjoyed uh, being a part of it. Awesome. Emily Best, Seed and Spark, thank you so much. Thank you, Christopher Holland. This has been another episode of the Film Festival Secrets Podcast. You can find the show notes with links to the things that were mentioned in this episode at filmfestivalsecrets.com slash podcast. Find me on Twitter at FFSecrets, and shoot me an email, chris, at filmfestivalsecrets.com. I'm Chris Holland. Thanks so much for listening.